Oh, Svaru, are you sharing these images to warm us up? No, it is to illustrate an important point. How not to believe with such constructions? People are simple-minded, programmed for generations to obey authority. They see great power and feel less without authority. It's like listening to a solitary YouTuber and not CNN. But although everything from one point of view or another is true, everything is true because if you observe it, even if you think about it, it exists. But that is from the higher existential planes. Up close, only with 3D mind, historically speaking, there is also the true and the lie. Who has power dictates what is real and what is not, and has the resources to impose itself, to create the impossible. The bigger the lie, the easier it will be to believe it. Hermann Göring It is easier to deceive a man than to convince him that he has been deceived. Mark Twain Before we start, you have to see the historical context of the time. Rome had conquered the entire eastern Mediterranean area. Egypt had fallen a few years earlier with Cleopatra. Rome was no longer a republic. It had become an empire. The Roman Empire was vast, gigantic and unmanageable for the resources of the time. The Roman mass media were their highways. It took weeks to send and receive information. There were revolts everywhere at all ends of the Roman Empire. In the north, revolts with the Gauls, the Celts, the Normans and the Germans. Where the name Barbaro comes from, which means little civilized, hostile, dangerous and problematic from Bar Bar Bar, how those strange and primitive languages sounded to Romans next to their advanced Latin. Their resources of the empire were being used to the maximum, especially the military to guard the vast borders. And there was an especially big problem in the Middle East from Libya, through Egypt, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Turkey, where its most important garrison was. A group called the Flavians had come to power in Rome. The problem they faced was a movement in the area between Palestine and Egypt, highly linked to the Gnostics. This rebellion was because the people were being given the idea that a messiah would come to save them all. This based on Egyptian astrotheology, which in turn was based on the appearance or presence of beings from other worlds in Egypt who had left legends of conquest and of fixing things in favor of the civilian population. One of those stories, perhaps the first and oldest, being the appearance of Ishtar, Osiris, Horus, and later the expulsion of Akhenaten and Nefertiti from Egypt by star beings with great powers. This rebellion is accurately documented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
the scrolls are said to support biblical testimonies. But in itself, everything is distorted for the convenience of the powerful and the church, since what is in the scrolls is a detailed account of the struggle against Rome and its occupation in Egyptian and Palestinian territory. The existence of the Dead Sea Scrolls, among other documents, and the fact that they have been hidden in caves and elsewhere, was to protect them from destruction and or confiscation by the Roman authorities after the destruction of the Library of Alexandria right at that time, just a few years before. Initial Indictment Later, we will clarify the why and how. The Emperor Titus, with the help of his predecessor Vespasian, put together a huge tale, taking what was known about the beliefs of the area of Egypt and Palestine from documents confiscated from the extinct library of Alexandria, to build a plot to impose upon the people idea of a new messiah commanding them to blindly obey Rome. By the way, a fourth Flavian is missing, Nero. From the time of Vespasian, a campaign had begun to impose on the subjects of the Roman Empire the idea that Caesar was an envoy of God, or that he was a god. In general, the people of the area, in the books it is said that they are the Jews, but I insist that they were not a people yet, only later as a consequence of the above-mentioned Flavian's plans, did not support the idea that the emperor was a divine figure. They tore down statues of the emperors and generally attacked Roman garrisons throughout the area. In general, this whole area from Turkey to Libya was a war zone at that time. They had multiple people guiding them, like the older rioters or the mass agitators. These people were called in the language of that time, a term used in multiple languages of the area, Messiah, which itself is equivalent to Christos in the same languages. Messiah, Christus, or Christ, which means that any Messiah of the time was a Christ. So it refers to any leader of the Palestinian Messianic movement. This movement rebels against Rome in the year 66, according to some of my data. The problem is that the movement was huge, and in many cases it militarily defeated the stunted Roman garrisons. So the Romans went into alarm, because they feared that this movement would spread to other parts of the Roman Empire. All resistance to Rome should be annihilated with an iron fist. It has always been the way of proceeding of the Roman Empire, and in this case, even more so. It must be seen that Vespasian and his son Titus were military men, with a military and tactical mindset. These two were the main Romans who destroyed and murdered the Druids in Britain, England, Ireland, and Gaul, and therefore 
they also had their eyes on everything that was Gnostic, because of the clear connection between Druids, mainly Irish, and Egypt. Island-Egypt connection that very, very few historians dare to see. Indictment 2 Vespasian and Titus had a lot of military and tactical knowledge. They had just destroyed the Druids and erased all historical documents of the Druids' existence and of Druidic lore in general. They already knew how to erase everything in their path. Everything that did not suit them. At that time, Vespasian and Titus were Roman generals in the service of Nero, who, at the end of his campaigns against the Druids, called them to suppress and defeat the rebellion in Palestine, Egypt. What they did next was send a huge military force of some 70,000 soldiers to that area to suppress and crush the rebellion. They started in the Galilee region and then they moved south. They destroyed everything in their path. During the military actions in the Galilee area, General Vespasian captured a rebel, a messiah, one of the leaders of the movement named Josephus Bar Matthias, who explained him a lot about how the beliefs worked and everything concerning the movement. He presented himself to the general as a seer, and to gain appreciation and forgiveness, to save his behind, told Vespasian that he would be the next Roman emperor. In itself, Josephus committed treason against the movement because he started working for the Romans under promise that they would not kill him. As the empire was in trouble from so much rebellion and so much war, year 68, the Senate, still with some power, pressured Nero, who ended up committing suicide the following year, leaving Vespasian as the next emperor. Titus remaining as total general of the Palestine area, destroying the cities in the area completely, leveling all the temples, erasing every document of the time that had anything remotely to do with the rebellion. So Titus ended up as the great hero of Rome. The area was already defeated, but in Egypt it still continued. All the documents were destroyed, but Rome never destroyed everything, only the copies, leaving a single copy that was confiscated and taken to Rome, where they are in what is now the Vatican Library. Since what moved the rebels from Palestine to Egypt was religion, and since the Romans realized that they could never erase religion itself with the use of force alone, they set out to formulate a plan to influence the Jewish religions of the time with ideology that was convenient to the interests of Rome. Note, I use the word Judaic referring to the group of religions in the area from Egypt to Turkey. But the name Judaic religion doesn't appear until later as a result of this campaign. Uh, sorry, what religion was it that moved them? You say Judaic? Just that. It was not one. 
It was a general disorder, but all of them were based on Gnostic concepts mixed with Egyptian. Monotheistic concepts that were born from the influence of solar worship, coming from Akhenaten and Nefertiti, some 1200 years before. What the human textbooks refer to as Judaic religions. I just clarify that it is not my term because that came later. So, if they can't destroy it, you have to influence it and make it convenient. And it is just at this time, around the year 69, note that this is after Christ in the calendar, two currents of Judaic religion emerge, convenient to the interests of Rome, Christianity and Judaism. And they were based on new writings. All they did was promote love, and people loved the idea of peace and love and the positive. Like New Age today, it's the same, but transformed using people's need for peace for social control purposes. And it is here where the idea of the Messiah Christo Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is found for the first time in those texts. Direct Indictment 3 the Flavians ordered the scriptures to be written. And how they were able to write convincing scriptures for the people is due to the Rome collaboration with various Palestinian intellectuals who cooperated with Rome, among them Josephus, as the main one who was now in Rome, under the adoption of Rome, for his services to the empire, and he converts in Flavius Josephus. And this traitor began to write the history of the War of Titus. And for any student of the history of Christianity, Flavius Josephus has always been associated with the origins of Christianity itself. And for the experts, it is one of the most powerful evidences of the connection Josephus, Titus, Flavians, and the creation of Christianity and the Messiah, Jesus. Okay, I have a quick question. These movements of love and peace, by whom were they promoted? by the Flavians as a military strategy, Vespasian and Titus. I accuse those two, father and son, of causing all the suffering that the Catholic and the Judaic religions unleashed. Oh, I thought they just took advantage of the already existing movements. Yes they took advantage of the existing movements to use them to their advantage, moving everything or transforming them from within into something in favor of Rome. It's like in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, using the opponent's strength and inertia to defeat him. Basic principle in martial arts as CIA does now with the New Age. Exactly. Flavians and people in power today, from the Illuminati and groups in power, do not believe in religions. They know that's for people. The Flavians, for example, under the deification program of the emperors, it shows that they saw themselves as deities as gods. It is true that Jesus as a character with that life could not have existed due to the multiple parallels with other deities and characters 
in the ancient world long before him, such as Horus and Buddha. But the only true flesh and blood character with that title is Titus. This is not just stellar information. Almost everything is there. This is not theory. It is documented. And worst of all is that it is available to the masses, at least to a good degree. But they ignore it, or do not pay attention to it, being so indoctrinated. The amount of information I have about this is enormous and complex, since it involves conspiracies after conspiracies, necessary to understand what was happening at that time. It is information that is already on earth, since the tale of Jesus and the Christians is almost entirely, if not entirely, of merely human origin. In this case, contrary to what some say about how the Archons create religions to control humans, while it can be argued that the Caesars, Vespasius and Titus and of course Nero are lizards or are led by lizards, from an earthly point of view this is a conspiracy and a distinctly human crime, with little or no participation of star races. That time in itself is characterized by the little presence in the area of the Federation teams and personnel. Notice something else, two important things that I still ponder how to handle. Conspiranoids, even the most seasoned, still believe in the historical character of Jesus. From there, they do not move. And now many are talking about the conspiracy to erase Jesus, to make people believe that he did not exist. I see this as a movement to shield their Jesus by the part of the Illuminati Jesuits but many have already fallen into that trap. These last two points are important, because I am sure that no one has touched them. They only go so far as to say that they are attacking Jesus and that they want to erase him. That's already extreme, but they don't go further. Vespasian and Titus were experts in exterminating riots that were inspired by religion. They had done it before with the Druids. Nero knew they were good, and Vespasian was their best general. Nero, Vespasian and Titus committed a grave crime against consciousness and humanity. And it is a crime that continues to be perpetuated today. In Rome, religions were not an isolated entity or institution. They were part of the state, like a branch controlled directly from Caesar's throne and they were seen as methods for crowd control. Christianity, Catholicism and Judaism were created explicitly for the purpose of controlling and altering the Judaic religions of the time to introduce religious concepts to the rebellious population so that the Roman Empire would not have to use its military force to control them. Using religion as a weapon, they could rule over their population, 
over their subjects. Extra important concept: Rome has not fallen; it just became the Vatican. The Pope is Caesar. This, under the effect of the deification program of the Emperor of Rome, starting with Vespasian, where, when Nero fell, he ascends to the throne and is considered a living god, and the worship of this living god is imposed on the Palestinian and Galilean people, the whole area, where, by definition, Titus. Becomes the son of God, further sustaining that Titus was Jesus. Not my theory. This is already documented by Flavius Josephus. Flavians, especially Vespasian and Titus, had the means, the expertise, and the motivation to create such a story to control the masses. This. Is weaponized religion. The myth creation of Jesus is related, or let's say it is the same as the creation of an egregor. The evidence is overwhelming against the Flavians, as the authors of everything. And if someone says that there are some records of Jesus, of course there are records. Because everything is set up, but there are records of who made and planted the records. The records that are used to validate Christianity and Jesus are the Gospels, and there is evidence that they were written by the assistance of the Flavians, Flavius Josephus, and two other groups called the Herods. And the Alexandrians, the latter with high content of atonist monotheistic interference, coming from the time of Nefertiti and Achenaten, all that is set up, and there is evidence. This topic is huge, because the records are immense. They have had two thousand years. To perfect their religion, to create countless alternate stories, to erase documents that contradict them, and to create artifacts, but they themselves left records in the Gospels. The Gospels have a classical literary structure of that time, with a strong Greek tinge here. They are attributed mainly to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, but were not written by them, by the people named there, and the texts themselves accepted because they say according to Matthew, according to Luke, which implies that it is being quoted, and it is not a document made by such characters, and this is as a tradition of the church. And there is no record of the existence of those four individuals. Name of the texts, plural gospels, comes from Evangelion, which is the good news of military actions. Greek, Latin, Evangelium. Why that name? It clearly refers. To Titus, Roman military victories. The Gospels were not initially written in Armeo or Judaic, but in Greek and Latin, convicting evidence of or about where they came from, who wrote them. The followers of Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. And furthermore, these people were simple people without the necessary literary skills to create the Gospels. Besides the initial language, there is also the classical Greek literary structure in the texts themselves. 
The texts themselves are not a reliable account of Palestinian society at the time, because in itself it was a total conflict zone, with few or no freedoms for the population, since it is known that it was the time when Titus dominated the area militarily with the idea or mission of suppressing the rebellion. It is painted as a basically peaceful area. The subjects in the Gospels denote a clear sweeping trend in favor of Rome, with the best known and clearest example of giving Caesar what is Caesar's. I guess it's money and possessions. So if these texts were created by disciples of Jesus, why aren't the Romans depicted as a total invading force in that area, just painting them as something minor or as an unquestionable authority? And also, here with the story of Jesus, not only the Romans are not portrayed as the bad ones in a story, as it would be logical if they were written by the followers of Jesus, but they represent the Jews as the agents of evil. Jews who themselves connect to the movement that the Romans want to stop. They paint the Jews as separate from Jesus and his disciples, not part of them, creating with this the separation between the elements fighting against Rome and the peaceful followers of Jesus, who are also obedient to Rome. Concept of turning the other cheek. They paint the Jews as if they were the ones who were fighting against the great divine plan of Jesus and not the Romans. What the Romans wanted is to foster an anti-Jewish environment to isolate the rebellion and cut it off, replacing it with a benevolent concept or according to the interests of Rome. In itself, the whole story of Jesus would focus on blaming the Jews for his death and not the Romans. Root of the so-called anti-Semitism. Because the Semites are not a people, much less a race. It is a group of languages of the Middle East that includes, among others, Arabic. Nothing to do with a people, but it is already understood that way. Another point is that I use the Jewish people here so that it is understood what I am talking about, because at that time they did not have that name, because they were the peoples of Galilee, or any people that followed the previous Judaic religion. Judaic also as a modern name for that group of peoples who followed the concept planted by Nefertiti and Akhenaten, basically atonistic monotheism of solar worship. These peoples were later called Jewish people when the Gospels were written, and they are a mixture of annexed peoples and the peoples called Hebrews, who came out of the great exodus from Egypt around the year 1330 BC, Akhenaten Nefertiti's followers. Although these people are basically loyal to the concept of Atonist monotheism, they were used as a scapegoat to blame someone for the death of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus, as punishment for the rebellion they formed against the Roman occupation. In the Gospels, the Flavians are given continued prominence clearly giving a not only pro-Rome perspective, but pro-Vespasius Titus.
Nero ordered his general Vespasian and his son, also General Titus, to dominate the problem of the insurrection in the Middle East, especially in the Galilee and Palestine area, although the problem extended from Turkey to Libya in North Africa. With another concentration of insurrection concentrated in the area of Egypt, Alexandria. Generals Vespasian and Titus were experts in the disarticulation and destruction of religions and the insurrection of the people, having already managed to order and suppress all the barbarian peoples from Germany to England although they also entered Scotland and Ireland to destroy the Druids by completely erasing all written records of them. In the official textbooks, it is said that the Druids did not leave any written documents. This is false. What happened is that Vespasian and Titus destroyed everything in their path and confiscated the documents, destroying the copies, as they have always done, and as a Roman protocol. Some Druidic documents were being kept by Gnostic groups in the library of Alexandria. It is said that the entire library was burned. This is also false. The Romans first confiscated everything, took it to Rome, then destroyed everything that was copies. I do not doubt that also originals and a lot of irreplaceable information was destroyed there, except that the Roman protocol of the time was to confiscate all possible texts, since they knew that knowledge is power, and they needed to analyze everything carefully already in Rome by the scholars and military analysts of Caesar. First destruction of the library, 48 AC. Vespasian and Titus were complete experts in the destruction of religions, insurrections, and also in manipulating the people, the subjects of the Roman Empire, with the use of propaganda. Vespasius and Titus, Flavians, created the concept of Jesus using Titus's military campaign for population control using religion to suppress and modify the behavior of the people of Galilee and Palestine. And note also on the mentality of these two emperors. They were the ones who built the Roman Colosseum. The Library of Alexandria contained documents from all over the world, because it was already hundreds of years old, being that before it, there was compilation of data from the Egyptian kings. I am referring to documents from all over the world, because this includes the accumulation of texts also from stellar people, going back to the time of Atlantis and Lemuria. Relics of non-human origin for data containment included. All of this is in the Vatican today. In its high-tech underground vaults and out of people's reach. For the construction of the life of Jesus, the Flavians and their legion of scribes used a technique widely used throughout that time that tries to take real events, whether present or past, and modify them, deform them, to give shape, relevance, credibility to an agenda. The information on Jesus is perfectly based on Titus's military activities using this technique of modification 
and alteration of historical data. The teachings of Jesus are based on the Roman Stoicism, promoted precisely by the Flavians, Vespasio and Titus. And it contains few original elements, since it also contains deformation and alterations from the Old Testament. The peoples of Palestine and Galilee at that time worked with a constant that was the appearance of a Messiah who would save them from the persecution and oppression of the Romans. Vespasian and Titus used this concept and the expectation of the people of the time to give them a Messiah, but in favor of Rome, with a goal to control and suppress the subversive activities of the Palestinian groups in the Galilee area. Under the concept of, they want a messiah? Well, we will give them a messiah. At that time, and under Roman orders and control, they confiscated and destroyed all information and historical documents that could go against the official version written by their propaganda chief, Josephus. But they took it further, because within the same scriptures fabricated by Josephus, he declares that the Messiah awaited by the Jews and the people of Galilee was the Emperor Flavius Vespasian. The idea of representing Caesar as a living God comes from the Julio-Claudians, or the pre-Flavian dynasty, Julius Caesar to Nero. So they only followed the same trend as their predecessors. Where did the Jewish idea of Messiah come from? Who has installed this concept and why? The idea is ancient and comes from the time of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, selling to the local people the idea or concept that they are the Messiah or their priests, following the Atonist model of solar and monotheistic worship. It is also fueled by the opposing branch of monotheism, mostly Ammonists. The concept of Ammonist Messiah comes from ancient pre-dynastic Egypt and is associated with the appearance and positive guidance of the people on the part of legions or representatives from the side of Enlil, that is, extraterrestrials. So the people on both sides, on the Ammonist side, Enlil, and on the Atonist side, Enki, waited for the appearance of a Messiah or Christ. The term Christus or Christ was used with or in other biblical characters, such as Christo David, who defeated Goliath. So it was not something exclusive applied to Jesus Christ and it was only more of the Roman procedure for crowd control. Indeed, the Messiah was sold as Vespasius, but as a living deity like God himself. And then it was transformed into the concept of the Son of God, which by Josephus' decree is attributed to Titus, son of the god Vespasian. And adding to the fact that the idea of Jesus is only a deformation of Josephus' narratives about Titus' military victories in Galilee and Palestine, so the transformed concept was sold to the people of Galilee and Palestine disguised with methodology, as that Titus is Jesus Christ himself, 
So effectively, every follower of Jesus Christ, Flavius Titus, of his teachings, Roman Stoicism plus concepts of the Old Testament, is only worshipping and giving all his spiritual power and obedience to Caesar of Rome. Today, still on his throne, with the name of Catholic Pope. That is nothing other than Caesar. The Roman Empire never fell, still standing, and it is the Cabal. This concept of Messiah as the positive guide of the people, have the ETs really given that or is it some fantasy or pure human invention? It is an interpretation from the people's point of view that when an extraterrestrial person arrives from Enlil's side, the town's problems are solved. This comes from the time of Ishtar, Osiris, Anu in pre-dynastic Egypt, and it was many times reinforced by the appearance of countless visits from one or another capacity of influence over the last 10,000 years, including the most marked here, which is the expulsion of Akhenaten and Nefertiti from Egypt, on the accusation of agitators and for imposing on the people a monotheistic religion when Egypt was characterized by its religious tolerance on the part of the re-emergence of its concept of goddess Ishtar. Asks Robert, And why did they decide to crucify the figure of Jesus? And why at the age of 33? Crucify Jesus! to give him a dramatic flavor of the Messiah martyr, so that the people feel compelled to follow him out of respect. Hence the concept that Jesus died for their sins. Also as a warning to anyone who has any thoughts of causing trouble. As for 33, in addition to being an important number for the Aetonist Cabal creator of Jesus, it represents a mathematical addition of the time expected by the Jews and the Palestinian people for the appearance of the second coming of Christ. That is nothing else but Titus again. Messiah first appearance Vespasian, second coming Titus. This because the story and the story of Jesus was written in such a way that it appeared that it was something that happened before his reign, still within the control and the kingdom of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which in turn were his opponents or rivals as a group of power in Rome, and with whom they fought politically for the throne and position of Caesars. So every negative action on the part of Rome in the history of Jesus will be used as an accusation towards the rival Julius-Claudian dynasty, and not the new Flavians, who are trying here to put themselves as gods. I have a contradictory data here. On earth it is understood that on the date that Rome invades Galilee, the punishment of crucifixion was already imposed, but in my stellar data it is clearly said that the punishment was invented by the Flavians and was not executed on criminals until after 800 AD. I myself have no way of corroborating which came first. I have an obvious tendency to believe my stellar data. Asks Robert. Question. The Old Testament, what is it? 
The Old Testament is essentially the story of Atlantis and everything that happened around it. It is written in such a way that it has two or more ways of understanding it, literal for normal people or between the lines with symbolism for scholars. Taking the Old or New Testament literally is a town level or for the people. That was the intention. It is part of a control or compilation based on very ancient texts that are strongly related to the Sumerian tablets, being that they come from the same people. There are three levels, Sumerian tablets, Old Testament, New Testament, same source and general intention, asks Robert. Same source, but not the same authors, right? No, not the same authors, because it is throughout a long period of time, a large temporal difference, but from the same group of control over humanity. However, the new authors collect and edit the texts all the time. Being that, for example, the New Testament has been edited, corrected, and reissued countless times since Josephus. Hence the existence of so-called apocryphal texts. That people of the church took away because it did not suit them centuries after Josephus. Later editions were not entire books, so they are called, are removed from the Bible, but only not very convenient paragraphs are removed or edited and or others added. The best example of this is the King James edition of the Bible, which is the most widely one used today. That could not be more a matrix with a purpose to control population. The Nahamadi texts, which are none other than the Dead Sea Scrolls, are taken to corroborate the Bible, but that is not the case. They just see or take or interpret what they want to see there. For example, in the Nahamadi texts, they speak of the Messiah. The problem is that there are countless messiahs with the same name of Christ's, because that's what it means. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they are not talking about the character of Vespasio and his son Titus. Rather, they are talking about any Christ, because there were plenty. So they just go and look and accommodate everything at their convenience. The Nahamati texts, or Dead Sea Scrolls, are fundamentally population records of their resistance against the Roman occupation of the entire area, from Palestine to Libya. The idea about Jesus in India comes from other Christs, other messiahs, from where that Jesus story is hung. Logically, some of those Christs from the Palestine area could have reached India, because I speak of hundreds of Christs. They were popping out like mushrooms in the rainy season. So every time they read in some ancient text the Messiah or Christ, they pin it on Jesus Christ. And even the name Jesus the Christ, Jesus means Savior or Savior. Those three are the same names. It means Messiah again. They add things to the story as the years go by. Again, it is said that it is not known what Jesus did for many years. So from there, they go to create stories. But there is no record of what Jesus did those years because they didn't make it up. Josephus and company did not see why, as it was not important to them. Or 
there was something missing there that they would later add. Another condemning point is the parallelism between Titus' campaign as general and Jesus' actions. They are the same. And it is not one or two parallels. It is everything, all complete. Only that we would have to compare each passage between the two, and that is a huge job. The one I remember the most is that Jesus said that if they followed him, they would become fishermen of men. Titus made a slaughter of fishermen in the Sea of Galilee during his campaigns, and his followers, his lieutenants, began to fish for men with a spear as they were swimming, trying to save their lives. So cheeky. This is not an isolated example, as the allegorical parallelism between the life and miracles of Jesus can be followed in chronological order step by step, hand in hand, with Titus's military campaign. This is perfectly documented by Flavius Josephus himself. That was no other than Vespasian's propaganda minister. But many, almost all the conspiranoics, still follow Jesus and say that he is or was a being of light who came to save humanity from the archons, etc perpetuating the lies of Roman politicians of yore. Jesuits, do you think they know that Jesus did not exist? Or have even they fallen into the trap? Good question, and the answer is definitely yes. They know, and they continue to perpetuate it for crowd control. While I don't doubt that lower-ranking Jesuits still believe that, those at the top know. From what other researchers have found, in addition to us when studying the context of this topic, the same thing happens with any other branch of human knowledge, be it scientific, political, economic or religious we have come to realize that theologians are seriously monitored and controlled by the religious elites, in this case by the Jesuits, who, as we have said before, are none other than the Illuminati. No difference. When a researcher comes to the subject of Jesus, Old or New Testament, Gospels, official and apocryphal alike, if they don't have the credentials imposed by them, the Illuminati Jesuits, they are systematically attacked from that side, as it happens with the official scientific branches of the Earth. If it does not fit in with their way of seeing things, it is not taken into account. I myself have seen while researching the New Testament subject that unofficial researchers face a series of lengthy slanders and strong discrediting mechanisms, being that the official theologians of the Jesuits always allege that independent researchers do not have the studies and credentials to be considered as experts on the subject, since the latter have doctorates in history, for example. To be taken into account as a researcher in matters of theology, one must come from a context of official studies within the official Jesuit educational venues, where they are forced to take an oath that they will not attack the conglomerate and the order when investigating their subjects in the present or in the future. Normal people in the public do not have access to the information I am providing here, being that it will be almost impossible for them to filter thousands of texts, books and videos made with enormous economic resources and labor, 
of what is true and what is a lie. The average person will only take as trustworthy what comes from media with official credibility. The same as Mesoamerican Indians upon the arrival of Cortes. They will be impressed with the glass beads and glittering things like crowds, impressed with graphics, expensive performances of biblical scenes, photographs, celebrity art, and volume of information. Taking it as true only because most experts say so. Experts that I at this time accuse of being in sync and in collusion with the control agenda of the Jesuits. Another order besides the Jesuits that I accuse of hiding the truth, and although they are many times intertwined, are the Masons, which I have found to be the same as priests of the solar god Aten, following the monotheistic ideas imposed by Nefertiti and Akhenaten, from which it takes his name. Checking spelling of name never used before. The name Gahonan, secret society, does not exist in the red. I can't know what its grammar is because I just heard it. I haven't read it. It sounds like, phonetically, ga ho nam. It is such a secret and ancient society, dating from the time of Akhenaten, that very few people on earth know of its existence, although they are the ones who run things from behind and are the puppeteers of much of what goes on in the world. Earth. They are part of the Jesuits, the deepest part and link to the high-grade Masons. And that is where the symbol of Masonry G comes from. It is their signature. The secret society is in charge of imposing with mind control and imposing rules that the status quo of planetary reality follows in the same fashion. They are the puppeteers behind the Jesuits, with the base in Rome, where the orders come from. Asked Robert. They are the ones who are a grade higher than the Jesuits, but below the Pope. Yes, to the top. High cleric atonists, black pope. These psychopaths move in duality, in balance, according to them. You are seeing the face of the devil himself, Adolfo Nicolas, Jesuit supreme general. In a figurative sense, from their point of view, he is the devil. This is the control system behind the truth of Jesus. The system that protects lies. I just want people to know that there is a control mechanism. So-called experts controlled and paid by Jesuit secret societies and Gohanan who enforce the rules and hide the truth squashing independent investigators. It's all I have to say about this for the moment.